I am joined with Max Showham, who has been nominated as a finalist in our documentary category with his film Sophie and Jacob. How are you, Max? I'm great. Thank you so much. Um, it's really an honor to be involved in the festival and uh, yeah, do, doing well. <laughs> Excellent. Really glad to hear. Um, so for those that, that don't that are watching this that don't know you, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit and about how you got into filmmaking in the first place? Sure. So I am an 18 year old uh, filmmaker and animator. I'm currently studying in uh, Concordia at, in Montreal, Canada, and I'm originally from Toronto, Ontario. And uh, all throughout high school, I went to this uh, kind of like arts platform school where I was like able to uh, freely and creatively explore filmmaking basically every single day at school. And uh, that gave me lots of opportunities to um, experiment and flesh out my uh, wheelhouse and try animation and try live action. And I made um, around like 10 short films throughout high school. And I mean, I've always wanted to be a filmmaker since like grade, like grade two. <laughs> but uh, that the, my, my experience in high school really helped me um, turn that into a reality. And now I'm studying in university. So, oh, wow. There you have it. So what was it about filmmaking, even right back in sort of grade two, that that just mm -hmm. grabbed you? What What is it that you love about it? Uh, I mean, originally, I think I was just smitten by um, huge films that I watched, like like The Incredibles and like uh, and um, J. J. Abrams movies. Watching it as a kid, and uh, I was just smitten by the spectacle, and I really wanted to create, like, start creating huge stories to share with people. But like as time went on, and I started becoming more interested in like smaller, more um, kind of intimate expressions, like in film, I realized that it is an amazing platform to um, meditate and experiment and create and just kind of feel out the world using it as your media. And uh, that's kind of where I am now. Like I, I've been making films for all my life now, like started extremely juvenile and rudimentary with my friends, just shooting using an iPad in my neighborhood with no script. And um, now some of my films take a year to finish and like this one, Sophie and Jacob, I worked on this for around a year. And, uh, um, but even still it serves the same function in my life as just this like yeah. lens, this kind of like feeling ground for me to uh, explore freely, I think. Yeah, so you mentioned sort of about the, the storytelling aspect and obviously Sophie and Jacob is a big true story in this case. Mm. Um, how did you, is it a personal relation to you with the true story or is it a story that yeah. you discovered? Well, it's about my great grandparents. So oh, yeah, wow. Sophie and Jacob Pearl would be my, um, my great grandparents on my dad's side. And um, yeah, I've known about the story forever. Basically they met, they were two Jews living in Romania before World War II. And then this movie takes place in the ramp up into uh, the Holocaust. And um, this actually happened. Lots of persecution went on in Romania during this point for Jewish people, even before the Nazis arrived. And um, luckily my great grandparents' family kind of caught wind that this was happening and they suffered through lots of hate crimes and um, you know prejudice. And um, they, both of them, living in different cities, they hadn't, they didn't know each other, independently decided that it was time for them to uh, like get out of Europe and um, try to go to Palestine at the time, which was uh, controlled by British, like a, by, by like a British legislature. So as refugees leaving Europe, like leaving the Holocaust, both of them met each other on a cargo ship sailing through the Mediterranean as it kind of like aimlessly went from port to port being uh, turned around because it was full of Jews. So it's kind of a story, it's a true story about how two refugees um, lost their homes and then made, found one in each other. And um, if not for that happening, I wouldn't be here to talk about this film or yeah. talk about anything at all <laughs> <laughs> it's so, it, it's weird of those sort of things that build up and make mm -hmm. make what happen i suppose absolutely so um on one hand i wanted to add another testimony to the holocaust mm -hmm. and like i wanted to keep that story alive because i think just telling 
our history and keeping keeping the flame alive and never forgetting what happened is um, you know paramount because Sophie and Jacob left left Europe, but a lot of their family did not, and they unfortunately were killed in the Holocaust. Mm. So on one hand, I want to keep the story alive, but on the other hand, it is a very personal explore, exploration of like my family heritage and also how I'm the result of refugees, which is uh, very touching to me because um, of the enormous refugee crises that have happened over the last decade and will continue happening until the day I die because of climate change. So um, it's, it's, just, uh, it's just very touching to me. So. And why did you think now was the right time to sort of tell the story? So uh, I really started thinking about it a lot in 2016, 2017, during the kind of, I guess, in, in popular media, in popular Western media, the height of the Syrian refugee crisis. So that's when I really started thinking about making that movie. I mean, I'm not implying that that was the actual height of the crisis because it's still ongoing, but I guess just in Western media, it was the height of the reporting. Hmm. And then I kind of futzed around with the idea for a long time. And in grade 11, at the very end of grade 11 in high school, I decided to use this idea as my culminating film. And uh, I had like three months to make it. And my original idea was, okay, this is going to be a hybrid live action animation documentary, experimental documentary, where I interview a bunch of my relatives during Passover, the surviving relatives of Jacob and Sophie, my, great, my grandparents. And then I basically string together these interviews with some animated sequences, like very impressionist animated sequences and create something kind of like um, experimental documentary uh, investigation about like the story. That crashed and burned, <laughs> um, you know, and that sometimes happens when you're making a film, you have to roll with the punches. And mm. uh, basically slowly, uh, the my little experiment, my aimless experimental documentary kind of morphed into a completely animated film. And um, so it turned it from experimental documentary into a very straightforward narrative animation. And actually there's one there's one element of the original film that has survived, which at the very end, there's a shot of a, uh, a candle being lit by my grandmother during, and, and that's, that's, uh, that was uh, during Passover. And uh, that's, a, one, that's a Jewish prayer candle. And uh, that's the one surviving element <laughs> from the original cut. I, I think that, that scene in particular I was actually gonna mention anyway, because it's just okay. so symbolic of that, how what they built still lived on. Thank you. Uh, and you don't necessarily anticipate when watching it, I suppose, that, that there is going to be that live action element at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's incredibly effective. Thank you so much. No worries. Um, um, I was also kind of inspired by um, one of my favorite movies, Schindler's List, uh, like starting with a candle. I think in Judaism, candles are so important. You never blow out a candle. You let it burn until it uh, extinguishes. And um, it's uh, really, it was really important to me to start and close the film with candle lighting sequences. And actually the very beginning when the candle is lit, it's the same shot rotoscoped. So it's my grandmother lighting a candle, but I've traced it with animation. And that's how at the end it transitions into live action. Wow. So thinking about the art style for it a little bit then now, obviously the art style is quite consistent with your other work. Um, what made you go down the style that you've gone for? What What is, uh, is there anything in particular that kind of sparked that style or was it- Ripping off my friends. <laughs> <laughs> so I, yeah, I went to art school. So I was like surrounded by um, people doodling and painting and drawing and making films. So I've just grabbed this, grabbed that. <laughs> and then, uh, I love Studio Ghibli movies. And yeah. I grew, up, I grew up with those. So uh, I really wanted to do a bunch of shots with like a lot of action happening in foreground, background. Um, I'm thinking of the scene where Sophie walks through the docks and like you have the dock workers working and like the, uh, the crowd. And that's definitely uh, inspired by like these huge crowd shots in Studio Ghibli movies. Yeah. And that's my little bedroom version of that. <laughs> and, and what do uh, you use to make the films? Like what is your yeah. square of choice? Uh, this tablet 
wow. <laughs> so it's a monitor and it connects to my computer. So it connects to my laptop and I just draw using a stylus. That's it. And all of the images in Sophie and Jacob and all of your other films, they're all hands are on, they're all layered yes. from scratch. And that's why it took a year. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose even for like a minute of that, that can take months and months for yeah. this to be a, a full length short. Yeah. Is a is a big investment, but it's a definitely a big investment, especially balancing school and uh, <laughs> like being a teen <laughs> with all its distractions. Yeah, exactly. But what has the um, audience response been like? Has it been completely favorable? Um, honestly, it's been the best response. The best response to any film I've made. Um, it's been incredibly favorable. Um, I, it was, it actually, I had the honor of sharing my film at a, at, at a, uh, zoom synagogue a couple weeks ago, wow. which was honestly one of the most special experiences for this movie, because, um, it was all these very elderly, uh, religious, uh, Jewish folks from Philadelphia watching this movie on zoom. And, um, some of them just teared up and it really struck a chord and reminded them of, um, you know, their families mm. and uh every i, I don't want to say every but m most old um european jewish families have stories from this time mm. and uh it's just really important to me that um it, it's it's really i guess gratifying to me that this was able to connect to them and i feel like i uh i feel like made that, that made me really feel that maybe i did this with respect so that, that was my greatest that was my greatest hope that I could tackle the story and make it respectful and um, I think I, I think I succeeded <laughs> definitely we all really enjoyed hearing the story and obviously the history behind it all as well Thank you. and obviously as you said with the Holocaust it's something to remember and to bring light on every year and I suppose we do with things like Holocaust Memorial Days yeah. and all of that and I think your film is is kind of perfect for that in some respect. Mm -hmm. Thinking a little bit about then sort of the wider you, <laughs> where would you like to see your animation take you or is or do you want to try other things that aren't animation as well? Um, I really don't only want, okay, so I really don't only want to be an animator. I think, I think with no money to make uh, productions, animation is just the, you can do any, animation is the most freeing medium of them all in my eyes, because you can literally, obviously like you can, whatever you imagine can happen. So if I wanted to make like a biopic about my great grandparents and escaping the Holocaust on a cargo ship in the Mediterranean, like I would need millions of dollars and an enormous cast and crew, or I could draw pictures. And, <laughs> I think for me, animation, it's a beautiful medium and it has its um, advantages, but I got into animation because it's convenient yeah. <laughs> for the, to tell the types of stories that I want to tell. But uh, I still love shooting live action. And um, I think in the future, I wanna be a filmmaker. And uh, I, hope that I'll, I hope that I'll have the freedom to choose which medium fits best the story. Yeah, And I think that's the approach that I'm going to take. So would you and say you're very story driven? So the genre is maybe less important or is there any particular genre that you, you sort of tend to drift towards? I, I think I'm definitely story and theme driven. And um, no, I don't usually think about genre. Uh, I'm very, something I'm, I'm very violence averse in my movies. I don't like showing violence. And I, I think Sophie and Jacob is, pretty much the one exception in my entire filmography so far. Like I, there's the scene where um, Jacob is beaten up and also there's a bombing sequence. But I mean, I had to, I had to show that because I like, I want to be respectful to the true story. Yeah. But uh, no, I, I don't think I'm interested in genre filmmaking per se, but I love genre filmmaking. I think it's cool. <laughs> like I'm, I don't want to sound high and there's nothing high and mighty about being story driven because I love great genre movies as well, but it's, but uh, I think, I think I'm I'm story theme driven. Yeah. Definitely. Nice. So then is there anything that you're currently working on or is there yeah. Yeah. is there anything that you can spill the beans on a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um I'm working on two projects right now. So well, I'm working full time on being a student. <laughs> 
uh, at, at in university. Um, I moved to Montreal this year, and that's been strange and incredible. And um, I'm working on a film for university. It's just a one minute animation, and hopefully that will be done by the next month. And it's an exploration of the time sacrifice that animators make. <laughs> so you're making an animation about yourself. <laughs> well, in, in some respects. <laughs> in some respects, yeah. It's a, it, I really wanted to, um, I mean, in high school, I sacrificed a lot of normal teenage behavior and activity so I could sequester myself in my room and live like a hermit making films. <laughs> and um, that was rewarding in the way that I got to you know, make short films that I'm proud of and talk about them on like a recorded Zooms, like this one. <laughs> so that was rewarding, but also, um, you know, there are sacrifices that had to be made for me to spend hundreds of hours on each movie while my other friends were partying and hanging out and like developing robust social lives. <laughs> so, and like, I don't know, I didn't have a hobby. <laughs> so, yeah. okay. And I think it's really important for artists to take a break and to live and to just live because if you spend all your time making art, eventually you're not gonna have anything to make art about except for art itself. And yeah. that's the worst type of art, in my opinion. To like movies about movies, like I don't care. Because <laughs> yeah. you've seen it before in some respects. Yeah. 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 So would you say that you're taking a sort of a step back for the time being, apart from obviously the, the university work, mm -hmm. to be able well, to sort of re relive your life in a different respect? I think quite ironically, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I'm going to do that. Um, this I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the end of the semester. I'm going to have a try to, I'm not going to work on any film for the summer. And uh, I'm just going to try to recalibrate and be productive in other faculties in my life. And uh, put that, put filmmaking on pause for a while. And I'm really looking forward to it because there's no point, like, again, there's no point of making film if that's like, if it, it shouldn't eclipse everything else all the time, I don't think. Mm. It's, it's, especially for someone who's young. Yeah. And then I'm also working on another project. Yeah, so it's very, uh, ironically enough, I'm extremely busy with filmmaking right now as I make this movie about taking a break. The other one is um, a commission project that, um, one of my friend, a friend, a good good friend of mine, uh, wrote a screenplay that's very personal to him about his child, about a story from his childhood, and uh, he sent me the screenplay to read, and I read it, and it was very touching. And uh, he, a couple of conversations later, uh, we're working on it together, and that's on the way as well. I don't know how much I can talk about that one, but uh, yeah, of course, yeah. But uh, it has to do with uh, childhood and um, trying to live in tandem with nature in an urban environment, which is something that I jive with. So That sounds really interesting, especially with the, living in quite a big city like Montreal or Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, that must be quite different as well. Yeah, it's, 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 it's very difficult to kind of connect with nature and um, wildlife when you're living in such an like, atomized space. Mm. And also the person I'm making this film with lives in New York City. <laughs> oh, wow. There is a, a big element of distance as well, which is very appropriate for the pandemic in some respect. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I haven't actually seen him in person since 2019, but we have Zoom conferences every week. So <laughs> there's that. Yeah. Um, so what is it like collaborating with somebody else? Because am I mm -hmm. right in thinking that the majority of your current work that's available is as you said, locked away in your bedroom, drawing yeah. away. <laughs> so I used to think that I didn't like collaborating because um, when you're like an independent animator just by yourself, you get used to storing everything in your brain and just like <laughs> being able to know exactly what happens next and like, okay, these are the keyframes I'm working on now and like this shot needs a couple extra in-betweens and like you don't need to catalog and write anything down. Yeah. And also I'm very greedy. Usually I'm very greedy with my screenplays. So I want everything to be exactly how I have it in my mind. And I don't think, I used to think that was the only way I could work. And now I think that's complete BS. And um, working on this film with my friend, Will, 
has been very liberating because he wrote the entire screenplay. I had no, I had no input in the story. Well, I had input in design and yeah. in like in a couple flourishes, but it was really his story. And it's been quite liberating to just be able to have total freedom within a fenced limitation, within the, the limitations set by someone who I respect. Yeah. And um, I, I think I think it's been a great process so far. And it's uh, made me real, it's made me realize that, um, I don't know, collaboration and community and uh, I guess communal creation of art is simply better. <laughs> In my, in my eyes mm. and I think once you've started it I suppose it's it then unlocks ideas for the future as well maybe 100 percent. it's a constant ping pong of ideas <laughs> and uh I really hope to make more collaborative films in the future yeah so what would you say then is the ultimate goal for filmmaking for your filmmaking oh, well start a studio Make it bigger than okay. <laughs> make make it bigger than Disney. Declare a nation state. Uh, <laughs> maybe use some imperialist tactics to take over the entire world. I knew there'd be a world domination plan. Yeah, you? <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, I mean, really, I want. I do want to create. My lifelong goal is to create a uh, an animation studio. Mm -hmm. And. Um, I'm a very anti, I feel very strongly anti-Disney currently. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy for me to feel, I guess, cynical towards the constant commercialization and corporatization of animation. It's not, it, like there are amazing creators out there making animation and pouring their heart into it. And then there's also this kind of very cynical, um, snide, uh, monochrome, Disney machine of uh, content creation. And I'm kind of, uh, it's, it's something that's taking over the genre and kind of ruining it for me, I think. Like it you have these tent poles. That manpower just to knock out uh, an animation of feature length in a year. Exactly. Which obviously then doesn't give light, as you'd say, to other animators. Is there any that you'd particularly like to give a, a bit of a spotlight to? Um, well, I think that I want to, um, I mean, well, just on another, from another angle, companies like Disney often um, shirk, like it's not as, it's not as a, okay, wait, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with this, um, <laughs> but uh, I would really like to create an independent animation studio at some point and um, empower young animators and give people creative control over projects and kind of akin to, there's a studio in uh, Ireland right now that I think is basically setting the gold standard of animation across the world. It's called Cartoon Saloon. Have you heard of it? Um, I know of the name, but I don't know too much mm. about it. So feel so free. They, yeah, they're a kind of fairly small, um, I think like 200 employees or something like that, which actually is, that's pretty big, <laughs> but uh, maybe they have less. I, I'm not sure. Um, fairly small animation studio. They made four films, Secret of Kells, Song of the Sea. They recently made Wolf Walkers, which is the best movie of 2020. Like if you must see Wolf Walkers, if you're, if you're an animator, if you're a film fan wolf walkers is like exceptionally good um and uh it's just it, it the, the studio has this uh kind of communal and ideological pursuit of filmmaking that i really connect to and i want to create and i want to create something like that in the future as well the the sort of your side of the atlantic version in some respects <laughs> yes Amazing. Uh, like kind of Ireland, I would say Cartoon Saloon is the 21st century's response to Studio Ghibli. Like it's it's taking Studio Ghibli and bringing it into a even more communal, even more cooperative um, and more doable kind of digital space. Yeah. And then I want to carry that torch. I mean, my this would be my lifelong dream <laughs> would be to carry that torch over to the West, to the to the West West, like yeah. Canada or America. Yeah. And that obviously gives spotlight to the independent, the young, the old. It could be anybody, really. And uh, also, um, importantly, we tell, like, Cartoon Saloon tells stories 
of uh, Irish mythology and they're, they're the, the filmmakers like family stories and heritage. And um, the movies have strong environmentalist and anti-imperial uh, messages. Mm. And you just don't see that from Disney and Pixar and DreamWorks. You, it's not as ideologically driven. It's more marketing driven to the point where the recent slew of Disney um, live action remakes to me have just felt like feature length advertisements. I think I think there's many different arguments in that respect because uh, I, I was saying very similar to you to a friend not that long ago uh, about the new Lion King, but then but then people were arguing the fact that it's a uh, creating a version for the children's like childhood so it's their version but it's so strange to me because there's already a lion king movie yeah why not why not just watch the one that's out yeah <laughs> exactly and it's also so strange that movie is so weird to me particularly because is it a live action remake or is it an animated remake because there's no live action in that movie it's all entirely animated they do. You know I mean? They call it. They've branded it as a live action remake, though. But it's not even live action. <laughs> it's cinematography. It's all. It's entirely digitally constructed. Hmm. It's that is just an animated remake of The Lion King with um, Eric Andre and Seth Rogen. Yeah, yeah I think <laughs> Disney is one of those very interesting companies that you could spend hours debating. <laughs> yeah, but no, these days I I tend to tilt anti Disney. <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. <laughs> maybe, maybe this is just my. Um, adolescent ramblings but uh i don't know it's just interested to hear different perspectives of course and those watching may not agree those watching may agree and yeah. i think that's oh cool. if you like disney that's totally cool i love <laughs> I, I love uh, the jungle book the the that's a great movie <laughs> classic <laughs> disney is where it was at yeah <laughs> oh my god oh my god like snow the original snow white is incredible yeah they had so many good I mean, they still do in some respects for different uh, people, uh, but the classics are definitely the definitely the best ones. I agree. Yeah, actually, a lot of my animation um, started as like I'm very inspired by the original Snow White. So like I do a lot of rotoscoping shots mm -hmm. in my movies. Like there there's some rotoscoping kind of inter interstitched with the hand drawn, which is just taken right out of the playbook of the original Snow White. There we are. So, so a bit of Disney flair, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> it's you got to steal. You got to steal. Yeah, definitely. Why not? <laughs> steal and then make your own. <laughs> I hope so. Awesome. So then, just to sort of finish up, then Max, um, do you want to let everybody know where they can find your work, how they so, can check out where, uh, what you're doing next? Yes. So Sophie and Jacob is available on Vimeo.com slash Max Showham, just on my Vimeo channel. And um, I also have a website. Sophie and Jacob is not up there yet because I'm irresponsible and lazy. But my website is just MaxShoham.com. And uh, you can check out all of my work on my website and my Vimeo account. And um, if you're really interested, I, ha I, put, I put a bunch of uh, works in progresses and um, and uh, like shorter videos and experiments on my YouTube, which is also just called Max Showham. So if you put my name into the Google search bar, you are bound to stumble upon one of these three sites. <laughs> so <laughs> if not, search harder, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time, Max. It's been really insightful. Uh, oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. No, thank, thank you so much. And it's, it's really such an honor to be involved in a festival and spotlighting young artists and platforming young creators is so important. And I'm just so amazed by people keeping up that hustle. So thank you so much. Thank you.